Now it's my pleasure to welcome an AI expert with an outstanding CV. She is an analog astronaut. She's a mathematician and she hold a, holds a PhD in physics. She founded her own compa company specializing in software services for weather and earth observation data. Today, she leads the ARIES team for AI for environment and sustainability at the Basque Center for Climate Change. Welcome, Carmen Köhler. Hello. I'm going to look for my presentation. So thank you. Is it? Okay, test, test, on. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here today and hello also to all the online people. I heard that they're numerous, so um, welcome to your cozy homes. <laughs> it's very nice here as well. Um, I'm really happy to talk to you today about how to never stop exploring, AI exploring. <laughs> so how many of you grew up without a computer or a mobile device? Hands up. What do you mean? What is growing up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we never grow up, we only get older, like what Disney says, no? Yeah, yeah I totally agree with that. <laughs> um, who had a computer at home when they grew up? Yeah, we all grow up. And who had a mobile in there already? Okay, very interesting. So, I, I'm, I remember the day, we see on the left side, this is a Commodore 64, for the people that don't know that. So I remember my day when my dad came home with that beauty on the left when I was a teenager. And I was very excited because we did not have phones, we didn't have any of that, and when you needed something, you went to a library. And my dad came home with a Commodore 64, and I thought that was the most amazing thing ever. So I thought, okay, in school, I'm going to start with the subject computer science, because I loved it. I, when I was younger, I also like, had like, I always practiced like the 10 finger system for, 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 like, for writing and stuff, and I, I thought it was great. And I remember the first day when I was able to send a message to my colleague at school, and just, just like that, and I wrote him hello, and he saw hello on his screen, and I thought like, bah, mind blow. Hmm? And then uh, the thing is, I have an older brother, and my older brother is a lot different than I am, and he um, always had a bit of beef with the teachers. So when I arrived in computer science, he's like, another Köhler. You know? So that didn't go too well, so after half a year, I stopped with computer science, and I went into home economics, so I learned cooking. Um, yeah, so that was my computer science career for that, uh, that stopped at that point. <laughs> and, um, the thing is that I still had that in me, and I also thought, like, with mathematics, I had the same that I always thought, like, if I study, I would love to study mathematics, but I just didn't think that I had the, the stuff for it. And so um, I just read books about it, and I just continued always dreaming to become an astronaut and to study mathematics and, and, com and program in space. So obviously, when I finished with school, I became a hairdresser. Okay, that sounds a bit off now, but I do cut hair since I'm 10 years old. And so I started quite early, and then it was also very nice. You learn a lot of skills. For example, before I was very shy and I didn't talk, so I learned talking during the hairdressing. So here I am, now talking. <laughs> and so one day I had a client visiting me uh, at the hairdresser, and I cut his hair. He's a professor here at the Humboldt University. And you always chitty chat, no, when you're at the hairdresser. And he said, hmm, do you read? And I said, yes, I read. And then he asked, what book do you read? And I said, it's Fermat's Last Sentence. That was a um, book about a mathematical proof. And he was a bit like, hmm, okay, my hairdresser is reading a book about a mathematical proof. So he was a bit like, oh, where does that come from? And I told him that I always wanted to study mathematics, but I just didn't think that I had the stuff for it. And he told me, when you are interested in something, then you're automatically good at it. And so, after the hairdressing, I studied mathematics. 
And I remember there the first day, day sitting there and all the beautiful equations and they always really relax me and I was like, okay, this is a good place. And then they also say like with mathematics you can do everything but also absolutely nothing. Um, I think it's more a mindset, no, that you can <laughs> see. If, uh, do we have mathematics, Should mathematicians here? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I really liked it and, and um, you learn a lot of like the, how you think. Um, more than I'd never afterwards did I ever do a proof anymore after finishing studying mathematics. And then while I was at it, I also did my PhD in physics. Physics of the atmosphere, uh, more to say. And I am um, at the moment, yes, I uh, already said that I have a company that deals with weather and satellite data services. And I also think like the satellites and the Earth observation pictures they're a bit like astronauts, no? That they fly around Earth and they take pictures and look at the Earth from up there. And I think it is um, very, very special. But my dream to become an astronaut was still alive. And so, in 2015, I had a friend of mine that I did my PhD with, and he wrote me an email saying, if you can't go to space yet, maybe you can become an analog astronaut. And so, 2015, I was chosen the first female analog astronaut by the Austrian Space Forum. So good for the Austrians. <laughs> and so you probably think now, yeah, we heard the, the word analog astronaut now a couple of times, but you probably don't really know what that is. I didn't know for a long time either. So analog astronauts are astronauts, they are people that stay here on Earth to conduct science in Mars-like, in Mar analog Mars situations. Why that works really well is uh, that we have very geological and astrobiological features here on Earth that are very similar to what we have on Mars. We see this on the picture here on the left is Morocco and on the right is Mars. And if you wouldn't have the letters underneath, I think it would be quite difficult for you to be able to tell which one is which. It's also that the pictures were taken only a couple of weeks apart, and at that time in Morocco there was a sandstorm, so it gives that nice Martian atmosphere. So what we do then in those Mars-like situ situations is that we wear a spacesuit simulator and work on different workflows that we will do when we go to Mars. Here we see that on the Kaunataila glacier, for example, even though you say like, that doesn't look like Mars, Yes, it does, because also on Mars we have uh, rock glaciers and permafrost. But we do have other missions, like in, next, in two weeks I will go to Armenia for a month, and there we will have also very nice Martian, Martian vibe. I'll show pictures of that next time. <laughs> so uh, during that mission, that was the first mission in 2015, and it is quite interesting what, kind of, uh, what we have to do different now when we fly to Mars. So when we fly to Mars, it takes around seven months. So you don't want to forget anything, right? So if you forget your, your keys to the Mars habitat or something, yeah, you won't go back for seven months. Also, if we say, Houston, we've got a problem on Mars, it takes an average 10 minutes to go travel to Earth, and then if they ask, oh, what's the problem, it takes another 10 minutes around to go back. So we also, that, the, the time lag that we have on average of 10 minutes between Mars and Earth, that is something that we also take into account because that changes the whole situation. Because like that, we don't have the mission control center anymore like we have in Houston now. We have a mission support center, which is located in Austria, before in Innsbruck, now it will be in Vienna, um, where we then, with 10 minute time delay, have the communication. What changes? It changes that on Mars we have to be a lot more autonomous. And that is where it comes into play again, that we have to have, of course, artificial intelligence, and we collect a lot of data, so we are able to, do, to um, take decisions based on data. And we have a lot of robots also following us around, helping us on Mars here. This was 2015, now this time we come like with uh, like four huge and biggies with arms and stuff, so um, yeah, we really test the human-machine um, interface, which is uh, really, really nice. Because when we fly to Mars, we have to know what we're doing. This is here, and I don't see, know how well you see the screen, is it? Yeah, so this is Oman, and, uh, and in the middle there is an analog astronaut. So when we were there, it felt like the first 
they were really the first um, astronauts on Mars. Because the spacesuit simulator, I, I have to say, also weighs 50 kilos, and it takes two hours to put on. So now in Armenia, it will be quite interesting because we will be um, six analog astronauts in a habitat for, um, for a month, and we're only allowed to go outside with a spacesuit simulator. And how many people are inspired now and want to know more about space? <laughs> yeah. And the nice thing is that it's the same with kids. And that is why we, uh, about five years ago, and I have two people here that were also engaged in Code for Space, um, it's an um, elementary school competition that we started called Code for Space, where, um, where kids can program a Calliope Mini and develop different experiments for space, for the International Space Station. And the, the winner was actually allowed to, the, with the Calliope of the winner, and the experiment was allowed to fly to space. And what I really liked about that project, and also continuing with workshops for Code for Space, is that there are also so many girls that get very, very inspired by this topic. We notice when we have more like uh, rover Mars workshops, we have a lot more boys, but when we do Code for Space and just astronaut things, we have a lot of girls that are, we always have more than 50% of females that are really ins um, inspired by this subject. So, it was really then, everything worked out, and we see here the female astronaut, um, Samantha Cristoforetti, with the Calliope and the winner experiment on the International Space Station, with the space bouncing ball, it was so called. <laughs> Um, at that time, I was then working at the Fraunhofer Institute already and was working in AI and education. Other different projects that we had, for example, was AI in vocational schools. By the way, um, for Code for Space, you have also like e-learning on YouTube, and we have a lot of material also which you can download for free. So if anybody's interested in that, feel free to um, come up to me. Another one is that AI in vocational schools is KI in der Berufsausbildung, where we also have a e-learning and also have a lot of material for teachers that are interested. The interesting thing was when we developed AI in vocational schools is that we went to vocational schools and held the tutorials and did the workshops with them and then noticed that there was a huge gap and when we did the workshop with the younger people and with the teachers. And that was really interesting that the, what they needed really was very, very different when we were with the younger people. They're like, AI is totally normal. Like when I play computer games and it rings at the doorbell, I just go to the ro uh, doorbell and the AI continues playing for me. No? Well, for example, they just, they're just really have AI or, or different applications using AI really integrated in their life. It's really different if you look at the teachers, because when they hear artificial intelligence, they get a bit intimidated, especially as they're supposed to teach it and have to be the smarter one in the field, that they get intimidated by the topic. And uh, some were able then to that we talk to them and we can say, okay, that the, that the younger people then hold different workshops with, with the rest of the school, that the teachers have to facilitate rather than to teach the different subjects. So then, also in the next program that we developed, AI for Schools, we then decided to really do two different routes. We really decided to have an AI for Schools for teachers and one for students, and they're very, very different. And this is from the Fraunhofer Institute, and they're doing that. So if you're interested, I can also connect you there. So what is different is that for the students, we really to go into AI. We really go into programming also with them because they're, for them, they're, they're all digital natives. No, they're also, they're all really ha um, easy to, they can just drop and drag and drop a lot of the AI applications. They're really, you know, they're really quick with the developing different tools. Whereas for the teachers, we go more into like, like getting closer to AI, taking uh, the fear of artificial intelligence, and then also talking about, about ethics as well. That is something that we also do, of course, with the, with the students, but in different ways. And that to really show also the teachers that it's not only for computer science that you need to have the data literacy. It's not only in computer science that you, do, that you have the applications. No, in, every, in almost every 
subject you have in school, there's somehow you can integrate the knowledge on machine learning, on artificial intelligence. There are so many applications that you can do with the kids and you really have to teach them how because there is so much coming. Because when we, we look at different pictures, I mean, you can just generate whatever you want, no? You can uh, generate pictures. Yeah. yeah, I don't know why I chose that. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, but also, there, there are different, different examples nowadays. Muss ich nie wieder Fremdsprachen lernen? In jede beliebige Fremdsprache wechseln, ganz ohne Vokabeltest. Kritrim Buddhimatta hame ek kadam karib lati hai. Aktuelle Tools können bereits mit wenigen Klicks den Text eines vorhandenen Videos übersetzen. Clone my voice and even generate matching lip movements. Out of nowhere, I find myself speaking English or Portuguese fluently. Às vezes, a tradução ainda falha. So that is an example no, for the translations that are just, I mean, the, the lip movement is changed, there's a translation from the text and, and different, I mean, it's, it's crazy, no? And you don't really notice it. Another thing, the, who knows the Zora, it's from OpenAI from a week ago, where you, have, where you have like a prompt to video now, a text to video. So you have, this is a video that I'm going to show now, is a flock of paper airplanes, because I thought we were still with space and flying today. Paper airplanes flutters through a dense jungle, weaving around trees as if they were migrating birds. And that is then the video you get, just if you write that prompt. And that, I mean, there, there are a lot of different videos for different uh, small prompts that you can write, and it's crazy how realistic they look. So we're not only here like with fake news, but it's really starting to become fake reality because there are also a lot of videos with people and you don't know are these real people or they're not real. And all of that is so important to teach to the students to know how do I deal with that. First of all, it's super interesting to create those videos because it's also very creative, but then also to understand who, which sources can I trust? What is trustworthy nowadays? And that is very, uh, very, very important. And also the question when we use ChatGPT, I mean, so congratulations that your proposal went through this the, uh, three years ago for this project. I know like we wrote different proposals for the for science now and then I, the people share their screen and they just have like five chat GPT w windows open. No, and you're just like, mm, okay, <laughs> let's go over this proposal. No, or like with, with different things. It's so easy nowadays to do things with chat GPT. But how will we go in the future? How will, be uh, how will we be able in a world where we where we rapidly develop artificial intelligence, how can we nurture human intelligence? And that is very important because in also school, we can t how do we know that something is not made by ChatGPT? How can we then see well, how smart or where somebody needs help? How we can, can we support the kids? Because before, I mean, you could Google some things, of course, but now with ChatGPT, I mean, you can write everything that you want, right? So I think that we really have to revolutionize how we do deal with it and the how we still keep on making people think and develop their human intelligence. And here we see, for example, you know, with the face recognition that you could say like, okay, now and today I know that, that uh, um, Peter didn't pay attention 40% of the time and you can just evaluate that you know, by face recognition. Those things, of course, nowadays work but do we want to use them, for example? How many things do we want to use? And what for? You know, so I think that it's, we're living in really interesting times where we, I think, have to be fast-paced and make decisions to be able to, to use the things in a way that is ethical. Because at the end, of course, where data exists, we can use artificial intelligence, but uh, for the, the students nowadays, I mean, it's especially the, the right side where the social media is, is very important because uh, the statistic is at the moment that, that kids are around three, three hours every day on social media. And if they, they have to understand what does the TikTok algorithm do? What happens with the data that I put into the phone? I, one, one boy said, my data is safe. It's my mobile is in my pocket. Now we have to... <laughs> Uh, there, it's important what you do with the passwords, what is, happens with cybersecurity. All of those things are super important, but how can teachers 
put those in their curriculum. I have a lot of friends that are teachers, and even without artificial, int artificial intelligence, I mean, they have enough work. <laughs> no? So I think it's really important that when we try to support teachers, that we really put everything to their use, that they can just download, just say, here, you do it, and that they don't have to, to take up too much of their own time to integrate those things, the new things, into their curriculum. Because I think only then it will work. Because at the end, artificial intelligence, I mean, it started that you just have pattern recognitions, no? that you have to, uh, to just see, like, okay, is it a blueberry muffin? Is it a chihuahua? Who knows? But the important thing is that, that you really have to see, um, in order to have a fair AI, you have, di have to have diverse data. And that is also something that we have to transmit. Because if we, for example, stay at the example that I started with the uh, analog astronauts in space, um, I was, there was the third class of analog astronauts. At that point, there were about 10 uh, male analog astronauts, and I was the only female. And we do a lot of testing. Now, at the end, when you go to space or when you are part of those missions, you are like the, the experiment bunny, you know? And then you always have to sign a lot of things, you create a lot of data, and then la and the latest, the GDPR was, was not held really when I have to put my gender, no? So I was like, female, and then it was clear whose data it was, no? <laughs> and so <laughs> nowadays we're two females and 15 uh, analog astronauts, so still it's a bit 50-50 chance of who the data belongs to when you cross the female, <laughs> female one. But it's not only for us on the Earth, but also in space. This is the, the astronaut class from the um, European Space Agency from 2009, and yeah, we had Samantha Cristoforetti. So in general, when we talk about space, we don't have a lot of data about females. So it's about 10% of the people in space were female, and, and there are a lot of, especially like medical issues, that are very, very different. For example, that a lot of, well, of the hormonal things are quite clear, but there are also a lot of other things for example, that astronauts, when they come back, they have quite a lot of um, problems with the eyes. Interestingly, that that's doesn't hold for females, and they don't understand why at all. The thing is, when you're in space, because you don't have the gravity, it's as if you're kind of lying with your head tilted downwards in a degree of minus seven. So you kind of, you always have a bit of the flushed face, no? but you have a lot more pressure on the eyes, and that's why they thought, oh, it's normal that they have problems with the eyes. But why do the females don't have that so much? But for that, we don't have enough de uh, data, for example. So, yeah, just know that you know your data, understand your data, because if you know that you only have triangles, you cannot get the squares. No? And that is something that is super interesting and very important for the kids to understand when they look at their machine learning. Because that is not only important for space, but also, for example, in hairdressing. When I did the classes for AI for vocational schools, I also talked to a lot of teachers from hairdressing, which was really, really nice. And they, they do a lot with programming as well, for example, and they taught data literacy and co computer science competencies. And one thing, for example, is, I mean, the, everybody know, or the kids know it, know with the social media, if you have the different filters. And that is something that you can use very well at hairdressing, for example because then you already know that a hair color or a haircut might not look so good, and then you like, don't have to shed too many tears afterwards. So nowadays, I'm um, at the Bus Center of Climate Change, and um, I'm the team manager from ARIES, which is the group from Artificial Intelligence for Environment and Sustainability. And what I really like about those projects that deal with climate da and data and climate change is that there is no, no, I mean, the clouds will not be so sad when you do the forecast wrong, no? And with the bias and stuff, not, not so much ha happens because you don't have private data. So I think Earth observation data or measurements are a really nice basis to start with the kids. They're really ni there's a nice project also um, from GI, no? together with the University of Bochum, with the Climate Data Entrepreneurial Club, for example. It's also for education in that field because that is, they can feel like the sad <laughs> shout out. <laughs> and because that way they can also feel like astronauts, right? If they look at satellite data, for example, and as a, it's not privacy data, so you don't have those ethical aspects behind it as well. 
So I think the most important thing is really to ignite the curiosity of the students and kids because that way they want to learn, that way they get interested, and then they want to do the things. So I think it's very important to never stop learning and never stop exploring. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen, for your wonderful keynote speech. So are there any questions from the online people or you to Carmen? Yeah. Yes. What kind of experiments are you doing in the um, analog astronauts in the next month? Um, in the next mission, um, we have but very different experiments this time. We have, for, for example, um, we have the, it's called the Exploration Cascade, that we kind of pretend we're, that we don't know the region, and then we try to map the region and find out more about it for using different cycles. No? So we, use, we have drones, for example, that map the region. We have the rovers that drive around, and um, then we go out as analog astronauts and take geological measures. And then we have also in the habitat, we have um, a lot of things where, where we can prepare the, the rocks. It's crazy that to make them only a couple of micrometer um, thick and to analyze where, the, where they came from, basically to understand really the process of really pretending we fly to Mars and are in a region that we, d where we don't know. So that is, for example, some of the things that we do and we have a lot of psychological experiments, why is also why I said before with the privacy data and then I'm female, um, always has a huge um, impact on that. So we have to write, we journal, we have to see like with the stress, we also have ESA coaches to, to, to see like who has which personality, what kind of teams work well together. That is a very, very important thing. One thing for the analog astronauts, one criteria was for example to have humor, because I think that is the most important thing, because we will not sleep, we will be very stressed, so at least laugh while you're stressed. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of those, those things as well. Are there any other questions? And I don't know, online? Yeah, Daniel. Ah, okay. Thank you. Um, can you elaborate a little more on the program? How do you qualify for that? Who can apply for that? Because uh, <laughs> I think... <laughs> Maybe, maybe not for me, I'm probably too old for that, but uh, <laughs> I think there are a lot of people who might be interested in, in, in uh, yeah, learn, learn more about that. Okay. Who needs to talk about AI or computer science competencies? <laughs> Let's talk about space. <laughs> um, so the Austrian Space Forum, every couple of years they have a call for analog astronauts. And then we have, I can, we have internet and video. I'll show you the, the video for it, it's really nice. Um, so, so, because 2015, they, um, they had like a call for analog astronauts and that my, that my friend sent me, no? And, I do UVF, because yeah, normally, I, sometimes I have that in my presentation, but not today. Um, and it was really nice. I saw the video then of it for, uh, that I'm to show you. So this is the other woman <laughs> <laughs> for analog astronauts also too. Okay, um, so uh, here are you the right stuff. So I saw this video uh, and, and I was like, I need to, I need to do this. And it says the criteria, that's why I'm put it on. Uh, the light. This was in Marbaco, the mission that was before. You have like three different layers that you, you always have to put on. That's why it takes a bit longer. So the epic music is the best always. <laughs> and now here. Those are the things that you have. Those are the, the criteria. <laughs> so the criteria were capacity to tolerate boredom, and they actually tested us on that. We had over 600 tests, and they, one test was that they put us in the room, 
and they pretended that the experiment didn't work and we were sitting there for an hour and they had like video cameras like seeing what everybody does one took out the mobile Boo. no and then and, then <laughs> and um, another things were ability to function despite threats strong interpersonal skills humor and um, perseverance so those are the main criteria so if there's the next call for analog astronauts, I'm happy to let you know we're all growing older. And uh, so I would be happy to forward that in case you're interested. And it's a super nice team. It's very international. We have um, for people from Portugal, Spain, Netherlands, Austria, Germany. It's, uh, and, and then we're the whole team at the moment, we get supported by 150 um, scientists that do all the experiments. And then it's us six that have the... Um, the um, amazing um, skill that we're allowed to then do it. So it's, it's quite humbling to say that we're there and then we're basically the eyes and the hands of the, all of the scientists that conduct the experiments. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, there's a question from the online audience. Yes, and the question is, if you ought to recommend only one AI tool for the academia, which one would it be? If I would recommend one AI tool? Yes. Um, I would recommend, I really like the Teachable, uh, Teachable machine. I like that a lot because you see what data goes in and then you can also download then the code afterwards so you can, um, you can kind of see really what happens if you're interested in programming. But also we, we did that with, with very small kids with a, because at the end, I don't know, do you all know the Teachable machine? Um, it basically is that, that you have a camera and you take pictures of things, let's say, like pictures that I, I do one hand on the left and one on the right. And then I take pictures of the left hand, I take pictures of the right hand, and then it does its AI tricks. And then, it, it, um, and then at the end, it always tells you the probability that you have the right or left hand in that, this use case. And what is really nice is that you see that if you kind of move differently, if you have something else in the back, that that is like what, what is uh, what increases or decreases the possibility, uh, the probability, and also to know that at the end you only have a probability for the outcome in, uh, in machine learning or in AI, that is also a really important uh, learning that they can take home, which I also we have the, with the large language models, no? I mean, there's always the, the that they always, is, for every word there's calculated the probability that there's one word after the other. They are not knowledge models, no? They are language models and things like that, so you can, for, uh, you can explain a lot. And of course, the for Open Roberta tool, I really like that as well, because in the Open Roberta lab, it's with drag and drop, and we have uh, neural networks in there. And we do that also with elementary school kids already, that they understand what are neural networks, because otherwise it's just really a black box. You know? And so also that is really nice to program your first neural network, basically. Are there other questions? <laughs> yeah, Victoria? Okay, I have my microphone in my hand. Uh, okay, uh, Karen, thank you very much for this presentation. I was very interested in the last part when you were talking about the data and the current uh, company where you work in. It, it, it's Aries, right? Yes. Uh, it's a co correct pronunciation. So, um, can you think of any interesting projects um, that, would, that could be interesting for students? Like, what kind of data would the school students be interested in and how feasible is it actually in school? cool to work with with the climate data because I, I mean the the climate data I can imagine you need a lot of resources to work with the climate data so do you have any ideas I I, I, don't, I don't know if you have any experience but maybe ideas uh, what could be interesting and appealing for the school students um, I think one thing is really nice if you do projects in general with schools for artificial intelligence because then the people the students really notice that 90% of us is about the data. And then, on, I mean, uh, well, depending on, of course, well, how, how difficult it is, but they really notice this, that they need the data literacy in order to work with it. So with climate data, the challenge is that climate at the end is the average of 20 years of weather. So then you already can think that, that um, you need a lot of data. So the question is, why do you, does it need to be climate data? Why can, or you can also look at weather data, for example, and, and that would facilitate maybe the things or ask what, the, what is the question, or, or you look at averages already that are, are already done, that are pre-processed for, for the climate data. 
And what, I, what is really nice about that is because obviously one of the biggest challenges of our times is climate change, so that you also have this educational factor about that. So you can educate them about climate change and then look at that average temperature, for example. Um, then for, for machine learning, I would maybe rather go for, for um, time series analysis because they can see things easier and it's e quicker to calculate. Because if you have to wait for two days to get your, your result, it's like, oh, this is cool. I want to be a data scientist. <laughs> <It's> like, no. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to also uh, go further into that with you. Yes, please. What do you think is the most important element for motivating a student into um, topics like math and physics that, like for example, uh, I ended up going into the humanities because I as well, I didn't think that I was any good at math. Now I'm going back to that and re reassessing and like finding a love in math and computer science and stuff like that. So how would you, like if you have a, someone who's eight year old or something like that, what do you think is the most important element for motivating them, like telling them, hey, it's not, it's not really that difficult or you can do it? Exactly what you were saying, build confidence, tell them that they can do it. And I think that as you were saying now, you notice, oh, no, I can do it. No, because I, so many kids go up and they, oh no, especially, if, I mean, I'm female, so obviously a lot of girls come and then, I oh, yeah, my, my parents said like, only this is not for girls, no? Like, and I have to wear pink. <laughs> and, um, so I think like really building the confidence is a huge part of it. And then igniting the curiosity and saying, okay, let's do it. And because I think the best way to, to build the confidence is do. And then once they've done something and done it correctly, then you have the self-enhancing, um, 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 yeah, it's self-enhancing at the end because they notice I can do it and then they're not scared of it anymore. And once they, you reduce uh, the entrance levels of fear, then, then put it with, do it with curiosity that they want to continue. That is why also when we, for the elementary school, um, things we, we did with Code for Space, it was also that, they were able with, with the Open Roberta lab, they're able to do write their first, first program in one minute, at least with drag and drop, and then the robot can drive, and then we're like, and now you programmed. So you know, none of you can say anymore that you cannot program. And then they're like, oh, I can program. You know? and, then, and then you can see how they're, they're building the self-confidence, and then you have to see, okay, what, what is the topic are you curious about? and then kind of see, okay, we can program something on that topic like climate change, you know, or what are the different interests, and in every field at the moment you find something where you can apply mathematics, programming, find data. I think that is how I would go about it. Yeah, that's another question from the online audience. Um, yes, the question is, how is it possible to keep up with all the developments in the fast-changing um, data and AI world when you're not a data scientist? Yeah, I know, eh? <laughs> um, I have so many newsletters. Um, so, um, good question. I do, if you find a solution, let me know as well. I just, uh, social media and newsletters. I don't know if that's the nicest way, but yeah, that's how I do it through social media. And, I, and you can have the, you know, the top people in AI and you kind of follow them and then they, they will publish. <laughs> what they know and then you have the nice newsletters like once a week at least uh, where you can see the, the newest developments and they're normally written in a not very technical style so if you're interested then I mean I also have newsletters with all the papers and more technical ones but you also have those that just have the, um, the overall things Yes, and we had another question. Yeah, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about the Code for Space program, what it actually looked like, um, what sort of problems the students were looking at. Um, yeah, I've never heard about something like that, so I think that's very cool. Um, yeah, Code for Space, actually, I had a friend, uh, there was a teacher in Australia who really wanted to, to us to bring it there, and we want, thought we're thinking about translating it. So, Code for Space, uh, we had the kickoff meeting uh, the day before was the shutdown for Corona. So, I think that was the biggest challenge for us because then the, the, peop the school groups that could, could then build the experiments, um, had a, it was a huge effort. I think uh, that's why also it, it was not as big as we hoped it to be. And we had a lot of people that were from, um, from Switzerland, because in Switzerland the groups were allowed to meet. 
So we had 80% of the experiments that were handed in were Swiss, and it was very cute because they sent them in videos where they, where they explained what they did, and it was very nice. And for some of them, when we published it, we had to put under titles. It was very cute. <laughs> um, so what we did is that we had basically the, the call for experiments, you know, that we have the Calliope Mini, and that we have to do some kind of, that they have to think about different experiments that are, that are feasible in space. And they first had to hand in their ideas, and then we picked out the best ideas, and we, then we said go, and then they could send also then the code for it. And that we did with the Open Roberta Lab. So they were programming in that. And once we're online, we can just go to the Code for Space page, because we had, uh, it was together with the first female German astronaut. Hoppala. It's .org, eh? It's been a while. Here. So, um, so we developed an e-learning as well. So we have like online course, we have like different trainings, and then we have like the, the material, which unfortunately is not translated, so it's all in German. But um, so we have like, oh, yeah, it's a bit older. So we have like the, the online course, and we we kind of just uh, explained like how can you get into coding. I, we gave like overviews about the space things, and then so with Victoria, we, we, we uh, the uh, students also then de de designing then for the teaching material, and we tried to do it also with the teaching material. We had uh, we had we I think it was really really nice because you have. Um, also for real hours. So we had like, if in case you have a double hour, you can, for example, really follow the ISS because it takes 90 minutes to go once around the Earth. And then if you have a double hour at class, you can fo follow the ISS once around the world for 90 minutes while you diff do other things. So we have really have the different, um, I think you have like Leben of the living on the ISS, no? And then we always, was, um, we had what kind of, uh, what you needed, but the good thing is also you don't need the Calliope really, you can do everything in the simulation as well if you want to program, and then so everything was really described in a really good manner, I think. And yeah, you see here the different, different informations and learning cards where you, they could, could print, be printed out and handed out for the, the, with the solution on the one hand side and the problem on the other, so the kids could also do it themselves, things like that. And we still do that, eh? Because people just love the. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, it's only German, unfortunately. Yeah. But we could do a code for space reloaded and have can translate it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you for the very inspiring presentation. Uh, I'm interested in how the relations are built with the school teachers. So I would like to know when you bring the projects to schools, mm -hmm. what subject area teachers are you dealing with, if it's more on the STEM area or if you also involve the humanities, and how is the relationship with the teachers when discussing the, it, the ethical part of it? Mm -hmm. Do they, f they feel like they need to be brave to approach these topics? Are they welcoming of it? I am interested in this aspects. Thank you. Thank you. So all of that is from the Fraunhofer side, so Fraunhofer IIS, and um, so so they have for for the they have the Open Roberta Lab. It's called, and for that they have so-called Roberta teachers that teach the uh, Open Roberta Lab and how you can program with that. And uh, there's the and we have uh, centers for that as well and, and coding hubs, so there is already a huge amount of teachers involved, and um, of course we do it also via social media. Or we have newsletter to reach more teachers, but there is already a, a large part is already involved, and, and then they approach us. For example, if we say for for um, AI for vocational schools, you had at the top, you could ask for us to give workshops. And so we had requests to give workshops and come to the schools. So that worked really well. And then we did also online workshops where, where we could obviously handle more people at the same time. 
and then directly to get better feedback, as you were pointing out. I mean, if you d work directly with the teachers, it's very, very different than if you do it frontally online. So I think that the teachers that, because as they approached us, um, I think they were very open. I, I think was, was quite interesting was for us when we had the classes that it was a lot harder to keep the, 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 um, the teachers under control than the students. The students were all like that. The teachers got a bit nervous, um, but, but they thought that the ethical part was very interesting. We had like um, the moral machine. I don't know if you know moral machine. It's um, basically where you have to decide. You, you have a car that's out of control and you have to decide who to, to kill, it doesn't sound very nice, but, but who, where, where the car should go. But that, is, but that is something that we say that for the autonomous car driving, that is something that we have to program, that is something that we have to tell the, the um, algorithm, how t what, what is more important, a life of a dog or a cat, to keep it simple. <laughs> and and the, that, that way they really, they really get into the ethical aspects and really understand also the shortcomings in that term. And until now, we always had really positive feedback on all of that. I think the most important thing is also there to spark the curiosity and then reduce the fear by giving them confidence to tell you it's okay if you don't know the things. The students can teach you. You can watch online tutorials. There are a lot of different ways other than they have to, that the teachers have to be pressured to know everything and keep on the top level of AI at the moment, which I think uh, that is totally out of the scope. And also for, I think, if there are new programs, I think also for policymakers, it would be great if they could just be a bit more flexible about the things that are allowed nowadays, because in order for the kids to be prepared, I think a lot has to change quite quick. And um, for that, I think it would be great to have a bit of support from the policymakers as well. So... If there's any other question for the moment, I would like to say thank you again, Carmen. It was really a nice, inspiring talk. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>